Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar. I am Shoshana Bryant, Senior Director of the JPC, and your host. Before we get to our guest, the fabulous Eli Lake, here is your JPC commercial. JPC was established in 1985 as a 501c3 nonprofit organization providing analysis of both foreign and domestic policy. We support a strong American defense capability, now more than ever, uh, U.S.-Israel security cooperation and missile defense. We support the Abraham Accords and the spirit and concerns that have moved Israel closer to so many of its uh, neighbors in the Middle East. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, and free speech and intellectual diversity. You can find us on our website at jewishpolicycenter.org. That's jewishpolicycenter.org. There you can read our Insight articles, our magazine In Focus Quarterly, the spring issue of which will be out um, in about a week, and we'll be posting that as well. And you can see our blog in context. You can also find our previous webinar programs. Um, some of you have been with us on these calls since early 2020. It's hard to imagine that it's been that long. We've done China more than once. We've done Israel more than once. Iran, Turkey, domestic security, the defense budget, the Supreme Court, and homeschooling. And we did a great program on America's hasty and ill-executed exit from Afghanistan. All of those are on the website. Download them and listen. And I especially commend to you last week's guest, Lawrence Jahas, who took us out of our normal focus on um, news headlines to remind us of two things. First of all, that the United States has had difficult foreign policy periods before. Specifically, Larry was talking about World War II and the post-war period, which were managed with bipartisan efforts on Capitol Hill. And secondly, that in fact, there are bits of bipartisanship showing up today on Capitol Hill. So we were rather uplifted last week, I suspect. Now we're going to return to a more dour outlook as we focus on America's future. The Russian war on Ukraine, even before there's an end to the fighting, even before there's a ceasefire, has caused a lot of people to reevaluate America's plans for the future. Allies and adversaries, defense spending and policy, uh, international organizations, and more. So we are thrilled today to have Eli Lake with us to consider America's choices for the future. Eli Lake is a national security journalism fellow at the Clement Center and the University of Texas in Austin. He's also a contributing editor at Commentary Magazine and the host of a new podcast, actually not yet existing podcast called The Reeducation with Eli Lake on the Nebulous Network. It will be released next month and I suggest that everybody go to the Nebulous Network and find it. Eli is a former syndicated columnist for Bloomberg, national security correspondent for The Daily Beast and Newsweek, and a reporter for The Washington Times. He's been a contributing editor for the New Republic and a reporter for the New York Sun in its first incarnation, right? Eli? That's right, yeah. In well, not the, the, not the 19th Sun's century. Back. People, you should go find the New York Sun. Yeah. Um, oh, they're very launching, by the way, now, and they have a, they've more of a staff, and then I highly recommend it. It's, they've been doing actually great stuff on Ukraine. Go do it. Um, yeah. Eli Lake, the floor is yours. Well, listen, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Shoshana. Um, and I just want to make a couple kind of quick remarks based on my essay in this month's commentary magazine titled The World Has Changed and We Must Change Along With It. So the first point I, I wanna make is that I think probably many people in this audience have known about uh, kind of who Vladimir Putin has been now for some time. Uh, it depends on when you wanna start the clock, but you could really say beginning in the early 2000s when he uh, was the sort of new president of Russia, you know, he, he had the campaign against uh, Chechen rebels and he levels Grozny. It's a human rights atrocity. And um, there really was not much of a peep from Europe or the United States at the time. Um, they were still kind of operating under this idea that Russia could be coaxed into um, becoming a responsible member of the community of nations. Uh, and they still sort of had uh, what I would consider sort of the nostalgia blinders on uh, that characterized U.S. relations with Russia 
uh, at the end of Gorbachev and into Boris Yeltsin. Uh, and, you know, the beginning of Putin, uh, he was embraced at first by the Clinton administration. Um, there was a famous moment uh, with George W. Bush where he looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes and saw the soul of, a, of, a, of, a, of someone he could do business with. Uh, George W. Bush would later regret those comments uh, at the end of his presidency in 2008 when Russia launched its war of aggression against uh, Georgia and still occupies Abkhazia and North Ossetia to this day. Um, but then you, would, you have the presidency of Barack Obama and Barack Obama campaigned on kind of ending forever wars in a sense and sought uh, a reset with Russia. Hillary Clinton, his first secretary of state, famously traveled to Moscow with a giant button uh, meant to sort of uh, signal this reset. And for the first sort of six years of the Obama presidency, the US did very little to deter Russian aggression. Uh, and all the while, not only did you have the kind of perpetual occupation of Georgia, but you also had a more aggressive uh, cyber posture from the Russians, uh, where they began to hone some of the techniques that we saw them use in the 2016 election in Europe and against smaller states like Estonia. Um, you saw the uh, campaign of sort of assassinating political opponents, uh, journalists are, are murdered. There's a drumbeat. Then there's 2014. And this then catches the Obama administration unawares, where you have a huge buildup on the border of Ukraine. And uh, Putin sends in uh, Spetsnaz, or the special operators who are not in army official army uniforms. So he denies that there are Russian troops in Crimea and the Donbass in that war. Um, which obviously would have been a violation of international law. Um, he denies it for, I think, about six months. And then he, he, he reverses on a dime and acknowledges it. But it's important because in the case of Georgia, we saw the Russians baiting the, the sovereign government of Mikhail Shakashvili into striking first because there were these series of probing attacks that were supported by Russian military intelligence like the GRU. Um, and then they, they used that as the pretext to launch the formal war. And in, we saw in 2014, the use of, of what are sometimes called little green men to accomplish this goal with very little resistance in a place like Crimea, we should say. Um, and that is different than sending in, you know, your uniformed military uh, and tanks and so forth that are just undeniable and in, a violation of international law in any sense that you want to say. There's no room for interpretation or potential fig leaf that would give many in the in the West and many in Europe until about a month and a half ago uh, or five weeks ago, I guess, the excuse to continue to do business with Russia. Um, so the reason that this is a hinge moment is because, you know, Vladimir Putin was not bothering to hide his hand anymore in this latest invasion. And that's the and, and and we see that in part from you know I think it's worth going back and looking at that speech that he gives on the eve of the invasion in which he says Ukraine was never really a country, um, where he makes references to the 19th century Russian Empire. Um, this is the agenda of somebody who has no interest in kind of playing by the rules of the international system. Which, by the way, again we would have known if you just looked at all the other things that the Russian state had been doing over the last 20 years, but now it's undeniable. You, you have to look this fact in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the face and see Russia for what it is. And so that is the jumping off point of my essay in commentary. And I feel that it requires us to reassess some of the things that we've, we in the United States, but also that the West in general has been doing for some time. And to sort of sum these up, because I really want to get into the, uh, a discussion with uh, the audience here, uh, a couple key points. The first is, um, I think we have to understand that there really is no chance that the Chinese are not going to be on Russia's side at this point. Now, it doesn't mean that the Chinese are going to kind of uh, play the role of like Belarus at the UN you know, General Assembly and praise this invasion as some sort of defensive war. 
Uh, and certainly they will sort of indicate that I'm sure they do feel somewhat nervous because this is, war has not gone well for their ally in Russia. But we also have to understand that before uh, Vladimir Putin launches this war in uh, the end of February, there were in January joint military exercises in the Indian Ocean with China, Russia, and Iran. They are already aligning. Uh, during uh, the Winter Olympics, when Vladimir Putin travels to Beijing, there is a series of sort of new agreements that they sign. They say there's no limit to their partnership. I don't think this is bluster. And the kind of traditional US strategy for the last 50 years, since Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger opened up US relations with communist China, has been to seek to play China off of Russia in some way, because there has been historical tensions there. And there's certainly during the Cold War, there were moments of tensions as well that were, in my view, you know, strategically exploited it to, to good effect in the 1970s, even though I would disagree with the overall thrust of detente, um, there, was, there, there, was, there was a good reason for that. We are dealing with a different problem right now. And that problem is that the US-led international order where all states, weak and powerful, have the same claims to the sort of their, their own sovereignty, where countries are expected to uh, play by transparent rules for financing international trade, where uh, countries are expected not to engage in aggressive cyber activities, where we have a general expectations though we haven't been very good at always enforcing it, but at least we have a sort of general goal that there should be regular elections, that the rights of citizens should be respected, that there should be a free press, all of these kinds of values that in many ways we sort of took for granted as self-fulfilling after the collapse of the Soviet Union, China and Russia share an interest in undermining that. They don't wanna live in that world. They wanna live in a world where the strong dominate the weak, where um, their, the rights of their citizens doesn't really matter for much. Um, and they also need, it, need, in order to justify their own despotic rule, in the case of Xi and Putin, they, they need an external enemy and that external enemy is always going to be the United States. So we should accept the fact that even though it would be better if we could get China to turn on Russia um, and that the Chinese will probably play along with us and tell us things that we want to hear in that regard, it's not, in the end of the day, it's not going to happen. We should expect the Chinese will purchase Russian energy on the cheap, that they will do what they can to sort of provide loans and help bail out Russia's economy. And while they may not send weapons, and I, they've said they won't send weapons, they will, they, will be China, they will be Russia's ally for this war, and we just sort of have to accept that. So that's, that's a, a sort of point number one, is that I don't think we should get into this trap of not doing anything against China because we're only focusing on Russia. And we've seen some discussion of that already, you know, particularly in the United States. The second point I would make is that I think it's time to rethink the actual institutions of the international system. And what I mean by that is, uh, organizations, whether they be Interpol uh, or the international organization that sort of sets the standards for the next generation of internet uh, protocols. Uh, these have been subverted um, largely by China, but also by Russia. And we should figure out a way of either uh, kicking out Russia and China from these institutions, which might be a long shot, or building new institutions that exclude them. And I would go so far as to include the UN Security Council. In my view, the Ukrainians have made a very strong argument that there was never a vote in the General Assembly to give Russia the Soviet Union's permanent veto-wielding seat on the UN Security Council. There should be such a vote. I think they, may, they probably would lose such a vote today. But if that does not work, and uh, you know, the, if that's a dead end, which it very well may be, um, then the US should should consider building a kind of alternative to the UN Security Council, and at the very least say that it will not consider the UN Security Council to be a font of international law, so long as a country like Russia, an illegitimate regime like Russia, remains a veto-wielding veto member. Um, so that is gonna take a lot of time and planning, and it's gonna take a lot of diplomacy with our allies. I am not arguing here for something sometimes called the community of democracies because I think that that's a bit of a bridge too far at the moment. Ideally, I would like the whole world to be a collection of democracies, but we're gonna need countries like Turkey. We're gonna need countries that might be backsliding uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that are gonna be our allies here because 
unfortunately, as much as I have many criticisms of Erdogan and his leadership, you want middle middling powers like Turkey to be on your side uh, on the on the sort of stuff that matters. And if they can be responsible members of the system, it's a good thing. But then at the same time, having a new international sort of an, uh, uh, an alternative UN Security Council is a great way of laying out what the objective standards are for being a kind of first class member, uh, first class global citizenship. And that is a, I think that's a powerful uh, approach. It's something similar to how the European Union had criteria for joining their union in the 1990s after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So countries like Poland or Hungary couldn't just join because the Soviet Union no longer existed and they were no longer in the Warsaw Pact. They had to show that uh, you know there were successive elections, that there were certain that they, they treated minorities, uh, they they didn't have you know persecute their minorities and things like that. This is something that can be applied, I think, on a global level. And it's something that we should start thinking about. The other advantage of this, in my view, is that when you have a country like Belarus, where uh, the school teacher Svetlana uh, Chinaskaya, I'm probably mispronouncing that, was the rightful winner of the 2020 election, well, she should form a government in exile and be represented on this sort of new body because Belarus, I think, has lost, you know, the, the, the um, Lukashenko regime has lost its legitimacy. So there is a lot of opportunities here for kind of creative statecraft in that regard. And um, I think it should be something that is considered at this point, because I think that the UN uh, it has lost its legitimacy. I mean, it was the farce to see the UN Security Council meet in an emergency session uh, on the eve of this war as the war was breaking out. And, you know, at the time, the president of the UN Security Council was the presidency was held by Russia. So it, um, I think that that sh we should we should understand that, that this is not that, you know, not rocking the boat is not no longer really an option at this point. OK, so this the, a second, a third kind of prong of the strategy, as I see it, is that at the very least there are, we have to identify what are the strategic resources that are dominated by Russia and China and how can we then create supply chains for those resources that will uh, bypass them. So the reason that this is important is because we, there was a, an open question up until uh, the war started, whether Germany would do what it should do, which is to cancel construction, uh, at least for now, of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which made it more dependent on Russian energy and Europe as a whole more dependent on Russian energy. Well, that's a powerful weapon that the Russians use, this kind of energy blackmail against Europe, and we should deprive them of that. In the same way, we have to anticipate that the Chinese will use our dependence for all of our high-tech products, from drones to smartphones, on rare earth minerals and metals. Well, we should anticipate that they will use that leverage against us particularly if there's ever a hot war that breaks out between the US and China. So we have to start planning now for finding those kinds of resources and catching up to China in terms and breaking their monopoly in many cases of these rare earth metals and minerals. Uh, I would argue that uh, one of the many reasons why it was an enormous blunder to completely bug out of Afghanistan is because Afghanistan has a lot of rare earth metals and minerals that would be very useful for the US to control and not to just put them into the hands of China. So we have to think about those sorts of things strategically. I don't necessarily believe that, and I didn't put this in my essay, but I don't think we need to like cancel Netflix for Russia. Our cultural exports are probably a good thing. Um, but when we talk about sort of strategic industries, strategic resources, we have to get back to this kind of almost like Cold War, kind of like almost pre-Cold War way of thinking about these things, because it's certainly how our adversaries are thinking about them, and we have to prepare now. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not the only person who has said this. I think that uh, it's nice to see that the Biden administration has requested more for the military in their latest budget for 2023. Uh, I think it needs to come up to at least 5% of gross domestic uh, product for defense spending. Now, I don't think it has to end there. I think we have to explain why we need a, more military spending. And as I see it, there are a couple of very good reasons for that. But the main one is that we have to get back to be able to fight two wars at once, not because we seek to fight a Pacific war 
and a European war at the same time, but because we want to deter that prospect. Right now, China and Russia, I believe we have to assume that they are going to be allies and that you know, there was a potential, at least, that if the war in Ukraine did, went better for Vladimir Putin, this could have been an incentive for China to uh, you know, launch an attack on Taiwan. It, it, the, the surest way to deter this kind of thing is to make it is, is to build up a military that is capable and has a level of readiness that would be able to plausibly fight both wars if needed to be, if there was an attack on a NATO ally in Europe and if there was an attack on Taiwan. If not, then we have to assume that if, there, if, if, if Putin probes uh, NATO and attacks a smaller NATO country, forcing us by Article 5 to come to its defense, hopefully, then that will be a green light to China who will look at us and say, well, they don't have the military resources to also fight us at the same time. So it's very important to kind of get back to those two wars at once. We dropped that in 2014 under Obama. Donald Trump did not revive it. Uh, so it's, it's time to sort of bring that back. The other thing is that we have to think about what are the threats today. Uh, to give one example that I talk about in my piece, uh, the Chinese have anti-satellite weaponry. I think the Russians are developing it as well. That will blind us in case in, in, in the prospect of a war. So we have to have a kind of rapid relaunch capability. We have to identify what our uh, vital kind of communication satellites are and be able to get them into orbit very quickly in, in case of a kind of anti-satellite missile launch. Um, in this case, it's I would say deterrence is not enough. We also have to have resilience. And finally, I think that we have to prepare for the prospect of um, what I would say is a horrific cyber attack. It hasn't happened in the United States really yet. I don't count the 2016 elections. I'm talking about something that would shut down a power grid, potentially uh, screw around with a dam, uh, causing flooding, potentially causing contaminated water supplies. These are the kinds of things that we began to plan for after 9-11, and we should really continue to think about that. And that includes at the local level, making sure that there are as a kind of chain of command in case of one of these kinds of blackouts or emergencies. Again, this is a way of, again, nobody wants a kind of devastating cyber attack on critical infrastructure, but we have to prepare for the, the prospect that this is a real possibility at this point. And if that is a real possibility at this point, we have to figure out ways to make something that will of course be devastating, but we can maybe mitigate the level of how devastating it is by preparing for that possibility now. And that's gonna be very, very difficult, obviously, given our current political environment, but it's something I have to think about. Um, another prong of the strategy as I see it is, um, as I call it, a solidarity approach. And that is to understand that we in the West have a built-in advantage to tyrannies uh, that are our adversaries because their most talented citizens wanna live in free countries. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're somebody who's capable of uh, you know, inventing, I don't know, the next generation of Wi-Fi or something like that, if, if you stay in China, your fortune will never be secure. At any point, the Communist Party can take it from you. If you move to the United States, you get to keep your money and you get to like, you know, live your life. That's an amazing advantage. So, I mean, this is maybe not a popular view on the right these days, but I think that we should try to encourage a kind of brain drain in China and Russia. And that means, as I see it, welcoming the sort of dissidents, the, the most talented people who are fleeing tyranny, we should welcome them in the West. And we should close our universities to the children of the regime elites. Uh, and I would include not just China and Russia, but also Iran and all these other places. And instead, we should give their scholarships to the, to the children of, of dissidents, the children of people who are fighting these systems. I think that's a very important thing. And I've, I've gotten that message every time I've talked to Russian or Iranian um, activists who are fighting for more freedom in their countries. They always sort of say that it just drives them crazy when they learn that the children of oligarchs and so forth are, are you know, attending Harvard and Yale. Um, this is a way to send a powerful kind of political message. And finally, I, I don't think that the United States or the CIA can kind of plan from abroad a movement that will cause a velvet revolution in Iran or China or something like that. But I do think that 
it's we're, we're being foolish if we don't think these movements exist already. We see evidence of it every few years in Iran when there are general strikes and mass demonstrations. We've seen it in China, even though the Chinese have done a very good job of trying to suppress this. And we see it in Russia, the outbreak of war people at great personal risk took to protesting it. There was a famous scene of a, of a Russian news producer holding up a sign saying stop the war on one of their live protests. These people are our natural allies. And I don't think it's that uh, much of a stretch. And I'm not talking again, I don't think that this should be you know, senior State Department people so much. I just think that there are uh, plenty of Americans who fled these places, who built new lives here, who still have a connection back home. And that should be kind of our portal and window into nurturing and figuring out ways in which we can support these movements on their terms. And that's why I say it's solidarity as opposed to regime change, because I think we're taking advantage of movements that are gonna happen anyway, because I am an optimist in some ways about human nature. And I don't think that human beings wanna live under corrupt tyrannies. I think they'd rather live in freer countries and that we just have to keep an eye on that. And so when there are tipping points and moments like that, there are things the United States and other Western countries can do to increase the odds of those movements, even though ultimately it's gonna be up to them. So I think that's an important part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 it's very similar in some ways to what, uh, I think US civil society groups did during the Cold War, and I'm thinking of sort of Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union, we should revive this kind of spirit. It doesn't, again, have to be government programs that do it, it should be civil society. So I would envision a world where, you know, the Society of American Newspaper Editors would adopt what's left of a free press in Russia and do what they can to support them and uh, raise the cost of trying to erase them in a lot of ways. Um, my last sort of prong of the strategy is really about us in here in America. And I think that we have to be very much aware that on the left today, as well as the right, there is a sort of horseshoe theory like agreement where these two sides that disagree on so much do you think that American intervention leads to kind of moral abominations. And we have to, we have, to have responsible people in the center begin to really push back against that. And I, I would encourage Republican lawmakers today, as well as Democratic lawmakers who think sensibly about these issues, not to fall into this trap of, uh, you know, what we saw, you know, a lot during the Trump years where everybody was a Russian stooge, which wasn't true and has the, has sort of the, the downside of uh, equating dissent with disloyalty, which I don't think should be repeated, but rather, just to simply sort of take this and to borrow a phrase from the 90s, use this as sort of a sister soldier movement. Say, well, what you're saying about the US interventions of the past is just not true. And what you can't, you can't compare what Russia has just done to Ukraine to what the United States did in Iraq, and to stand on, you know, to sort of solidly make those arguments instead of running away from them. It doesn't mean that everything in the Iraq war was great. It doesn't mean that there weren't mistakes that were made. Of course there were, there were mistakes made in every war. But the United States left Iraq in better shape than it found it. The United States fought for a constitution, successive elections, it fought for the rights of minorities. And those are things that distinguish it. That's why America is an exceptional nation and it's morally superior than its adversaries. The war in Ukraine is really fighting for the, you know, to negate Ukraine altogether. It's for the conquest of you. We didn't conquer Iraq. We uh, enabled elections that, 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 that uh, elevated uh, very anti-American figures like Motada al-Sadr. Um, these are just two very different kinds of things. The other thing is that the United States, the wars kind of, uh, you say the post-Cold War interventions, these were trying to enforce international law as opposed to just demonstrating that international law doesn't matter. That's another important difference. But these are arguments that need to be made again in our domestic politics, because there is this weird kind of consensus among the nationalist right and the socialist left that the United States is in no moral position to intervene anywhere and we're just as bad as China, we're just as bad as Iraq. These are empty and shallow talking points and they, uh, we, we, should, we should begin kind of refuting them now. And I would just say that we had the luxury maybe of indulging this kind of thinking uh, until fairly recently, but as Vladimir Putin has shown the world has changed and we're in a much more serious time right now and we don't have time for that kind of self-flagellation and frivolity. Um, and then finally, I just, you know, I, I sort of say this as an aside, but 
you know, if Donald Trump cannot kind of learn the basic vocabulary of American exceptionalism and understand that we have always been a nation that has opposed tyranny, even if we didn't enter into wars against every tyrant, then, the, then I, I would hope Republicans could find someone who's better. Um, I understand that he's, you know, he has a lot of followers and fans right now. I think I'm of the view, I've, I've written many pieces for commentary in other places about um, the real uh, kind of obscenity of what's called Russiagate. Um, so you can, you can be concerned in my view with a lot of things like critical race theory, and you can be concerned about various double standards for the justice department. You can be concerned, you know, about, you know, how, you know, the, this, this opposition research was weaponized and picked, tick, picked up by the justice department and the FBI, uh, to discredit, you know, the Trump presidency. And all of those are, are totally fair, but I don't think that that if you are concerned about those ideas, um, and those are the things that sort of animate you today, that does not mean that you have to accept um, this fiction about America's, you know, uh, the, 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 the folly and horror of American intervention. Those two things do not necessarily follow. And as somebody who kind of comes to things from the center right, my view is that we should welcome people. You said, we're, we're not asking you to stop caring about critical race theory. We're just simply saying, stop, you know, with this, you know, very one-sided and false view of America's intervention. Those two things not, need not be inextricably linked, even though they kind of are, if you watch like Tucker Carlson's program and so forth. So I will leave it there. Uh, I know that there's a lot of very good questions and I'm happy to sort of take questions, uh, so Shana, from the audience and others, uh, looking forward to it. So we do, we have questions. We have a lot of questions. Very good. And I'm going to try to bring them together. But one of the things that you said, let's see if we could start someplace and then work our way out. Sure. Um, that people from the left of center and people from the right of center should probably be talking to each other about moving forward. Um, if you look at Capitol Hill and you look at Washington, which is more than Capitol Hill, it is the administration, it's also the media. Do you find strategic thinkers here that you think are doing that? And who should we look to Oh, I see you raising your eyebrows. Do we not have anybody, seriously, that's doing it? Where do we go for help? Well, I, I, I would say I'm encouraged by the fact that both parties on the Hill have kind of been pushing the Biden administration to do more in terms of arming Ukrainians. So that's, those are good instincts. But do we have a John McCain right now in Congress? Uh, I don't know that we do. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about is that you will hear some of, in my view, very good rhetoric from uh, mainstream Democrats uh, about the autocratic world and a break with the autocratic world, which is something I'm calling for. And I agree with, it comes from the center right, but they often will tie this to a kind of domestic political attack where they are equating, you know, the populism that, that led us, led to Trump with you know the excesses of Viktor Orban and you know other autocrats like Vladimir Putin or Xi and so it, if if your intention is to score kind of domestic political point uh, points by saying well the Republican party is no longer a party that believes in the constitution and democracy well then that's not the strategic flinking that I'm looking for. I think that there's a huge difference there. And it's also, by the way, it, that's a great way to make sure that there isn't a new bipartisan consensus on the thing that you want, which is a strong American foreign policy against the autocratic world. Um, so there has to be a little bit of a kind of, maybe use the moment um, as a little bit of a, for, of a sort of like a, a blank slate. Like there, you know, in terms of, of, of wanting to find these new strategic thinkers, the first thing is like, let's have a little humility. Not everybody was on their best behavior for the last five or six years, but the world's really changed. So let's, oh, let's welcome everybody in who has, who in good faith wants to, you know, stop the march of tyranny. That to me would be good. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, at home, we're fighting the, 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 the tyranny of the MAGA people and abroad, we're fighting Vladimir Putin. And by the way, they're all friends. That's, first of all, that's, that's an oversimplification. It's not really true, but that's the kind of political leadership that I would like to see, which is that kind of humility. And we're not quite there yet, although I will give partial 
credit to Joe Biden for not using the moment to try to score the, the, those normal kind of political points that he was talking about in the 2020 campaign. So maybe then we look up one level, uh, yeah. because a lot of what you were talking about is going to be influenced by international institutions, international organizations. Um, NATO seems to have found a somewhat more unified position. First, let me ask, do we need a Pacific NATO? Because I would yes. agree with you and you say, you know, what's China going to do about Taiwan? Do we need to bring Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, maybe even India into a Pacific NATO on the one hand? And on the other hand, we have talked a lot about, people have talked a lot about um, the inability of the United Nations to do the things it's meant to do. I mean, most of us have criticized it on the subject of Israel for years, and now you see the problem in Ukraine. Uh, but we generally, at the end of the day, we stick with it. So A, can we get people to think in terms of a new institution in the Pacific? And B, can we actually motivate Americans to move away from the UN, even if we know that it's bad? How do we get them to actually say we're out? Well, I would say that you don't, you don't have to say we're out. We just have to build alternative institutions. Because, I mean, it's already obvious that the UN Security Councils don't mean anything to aggressive states like Russia. I mean, the UN Charter doesn't mean anything to Russia. It doesn't, this is all, it's a joke at this point. And that's been the, by the way, that's been the case for a very, very long time. The UN Security Council, you know, was largely paralyzed. I think, what is it, the resolution on the Korean War was because the Russian ambassador wasn't in the room or something. But, you know, it was designed in such a way that it almost didn't anticipate that there would be a Cold War. Um, so, you know, it's an old problem, but you don't necessarily have to just get rid of it. You can just replace it and with other kinds of institutions. Um, we have a lot of, we got a lot of leverage, the United States does, and or things that really matter. If you ask, I'm talking about middle, middle powers or paddle, powers are sort of on, the, you want to be part of an Interpol with Russia and China or do you want to, and Iran and the rogue states, or do you want to be part of an Interpol with, you know, the most advanced national police forces in the world? I mean, what do you, most people will choose to side with the West. And so we should think of it like that. And you know, as far as the UN goes, you know, the institution will say what it wants, but it is, it's already kind of irrelevant. So it's time to start building things anew and then we can maybe make a choice or make the choice seem starker. But I like the idea also of really trying to press in a serious way for demoting Russia's uh, status at the UN. I mean, if we could get, get them off the UN Security Council, again, it's a long shot, but I think it's an, it, there's a value sometimes in making the case, even if you know you're gonna lose, because it exposes the problem when you do something like that. So that makes sense. So this prompted a question from someone who's listening, okay. who says that if you're gonna do this sort of thing and, and essentially you're end running the UN, you're just kind of moving around it and yeah. thinking anew, what do you do with countries such as, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Saudi Arabia and uh, EU states who, who uh, support the Palestinian Authority or support Hamas by building in, in Gaza. How do you deal with countries whose human rights records and basic political behavior is sometimes anathema to us, even though they're on the right side of the great divide? Do you just ignore what they do at home? Can you? For now, there are other ways of trying to pressure Saudi Arabia. My view is that you can, you can get better behavior out of Saudi Arabia by hugging it closer than by alienating it, as we are now seeing right now with their, uh, you know, kind of dissing of Biden with a phone call and they're, you know, dragging their feet on oil production and things like that. Um, which I think just to sort of not to decide, it's our own damn fault in a way, because if we weren't pursuing a moribund nuclear deal with Iran, by the way, brokered by Russia, who's supposed to be a pariah state, then we probably wouldn't have all this pushback at the moment from the uh, United Arab Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia. So, you know, I, I'm not, I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, the Saudi crown prince should answer the president's phone calls. And I think it was terrible that uh, Biden was dissed that way. But on the other hand, 
uh, you know, there's a there's a simple solution here, uh, which unfortunately Biden administration doesn't seem capable. But on to your like larger point, what do you do at the EU funding uh, like UNRWA in Gaza that are continuing to sort of support Hamas and things like that? Um, I, I my view is that that's problem is a little bit taking care of itself right now. The Israelis have better relations right now than at least than a lot of Europe with these Arab states, some of whom are in the Abraham Accords, some of whom continue to have sort of, you know, almost technically, you know, behind the scenes, but almost, you know, barely concealed relations with countries like Saudi Arabia on secure, on a security arrangement. It is in the interest of those states, uh, the other Arab states to have this relationship with Israel. And they are doing a lot to support the right people, I think, in the, among the Palestinians. And it's no, it's no longer the problem that it was 20 years ago, where we expected that the Saudis were going to do fundraising for suicide bombers. That's, those days are over. It's the Europeans that are still kind of stuck in this delusion. And, you know, it would be useful if we had a powerful, you know, if we, if we had strong American diplomats exposing like how outmoded and this thinking is, um, and that won't probably happen with the Biden administration. Um, but I don't see this as like a long, I, I, it just, I, I kind of, it's, it, it's, I feel that this is like an anachronism and it won't be a problem in a few years, probably. I can't see the, why would the Europeans continue to sort of throw good money after bad when even like originally this was because if you remember the thinking from many years during the Oslo years was that this was important because a peace process unlocked a deeper and more meaningful relationship with these other Arab states, that this was the price that we paid for cooperation against Iran nuclear proliferation. Well, how dumb was that, right? I mean, now we know that that was ridiculous. The, 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 the Arab states had an interest in stopping Iran, regardless of what was happening to the Palestinians, which by the way, their regimes didn't care that much about ever. Um, so, so, you know, I just, the Europeans are still stuck in this thinking, but we saw the Europeans turn on a dime when it came to Russian energy, when it came to German defense spending, uh, you know, they responded to the moment, like it was like, was a 9-11 moment for Europe. So hopefully we can see that these old habits maybe will eventually die. Interesting. I, one of the reasons I think the Europeans did it was to say, <clears throat> if we support the Palestinians, you won't have terrorism against us here in Europe. Uh, which Maybe. also turned That's out not to be true. Turned not out true. not exactly. to be true. Uh, but they went for it. I, you must be an optimist or I'm a terrible pessimist because I agree with you. It's an anachronism, but I don't see the Europeans giving it up anytime soon. It's a sort well, of... I, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to necessarily be optimistic. I just think the Europeans are in a process of a pretty important change when it comes to their own thinking and their own regional security. So we'll um, see that possibly show up in NATO and we'll see it possibly show up with right. Iran and we'll see it possibly. So there are avenues that the Europeans might take based on their own interests that they're expressing now. Well, yes. I mean, it, that has nothing to do really with the Middle East. Right. So I'm just saying that they're in the process right now of kind of sea change and we'll see if it affects these other kinds of things. But the other thing that's happened is that the world has sort of passed by the peace processors yeah. of Brussels and Washington because Israel is normalizing its relationship with the Arab world, which everybody thought was impossible without a peace agreement. So if that's happening, then at a certain point, one has to ask, well, why are we continuing to, to support this kind of radicalism, which actually makes a Palestinian-Israeli peace harder to accomplish? So why are we, and, and I, my hope is that kind of reason will eventually win the day. I know that I'm asking a lot there, but we're already seeing a lot of other bad habits dying uh, in Europe. So let's hope that this one can as well. But if they want to continue it, I mean, I, I, the other thing is, I don't know, does it, does it really mean that much at this point? Is it, is it that much of an irritant? I suppose in a sense, but at the same time, when you have the Saudis and the Emiratis kind of on the same page, when the Israelis are responding to missile barrages and there's not a peep from the Arab League, in fact, statements that could be interpreted as encouragement, we're in a different world, that a world that like we're we're post Oslo. We're sort of we're the, the old way of thinking about it is doesn't make sense to me. So we're sort of post Oslo, but I suspect our Secretary of State and our President haven't gotten there yet. But let's turn back to yeah. Europe and Ukraine for the moment. In your view, um, 
first of all, I'm going to run some questions together here. Okay. What should Washington's goal be in Ukraine? Should it be a neutral Ukraine with all of its territories? Should it be a Western oriented NATO member? What should it be? That's number one question. Um, number two question is, is Western aid to Ukraine sufficient at the moment to help it oust the Russians? Or is it just enough to keep them uh, bleeding as an embarrassment to Putin? And third, how serious in your view is Russian nuclear weapons saber rattling? I mean, we've got some other kinds of saber rattling, but he did mention tactical nukes. Those are all very good questions. So let me start um, with the first one. What is our goal in Ukraine? I am worried that when I hear uh, Joe Biden and other people in the Biden administration say, our, you know, our unity is unshakable, as if the unity of Europe was the goal. Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, the goal has to be uh, breaking the Russian army that invaded Ukraine. So we know what a broken army looks like, and it looks like the Russians might be close. I understand the fog of war, and it's hard to get real information. I'm not over there right now, so I don't want to jump too far out, but I read the Institute for the Study of War. I've seen other experts who are close to it. And, you know, if these numbers are, even if half the numbers of the estimates from NATO are correct in terms of senior officers and enlisted people who've been killed or injured, the amount of equipment that's been abandoned, we might be have a, we might have an opportunity to break the Russian army, which is, that should be the goal. The goal is to stop the invasion uh, and we kind of, we, we would know what that looks like. I mean, this was, this exposed uh, something, a rot deep inside of Russia and its military. Uh, and we need to be taking advantage of that. I mean, so we, so I think the goal needs to be that Ukraine wins this war and repels the Russian invaders. Um, so that's the first point that I would make. And I would like to see that sort of articulated uh, plainly. Uh, and I'm concerned that we may not be there. Now, as for how much of the equipment that we're providing right now, uh, I just go on mainly what uh, President Zelensky has been saying. And if President Zelensky continues to be asking for more and more kinds of anti-aircraft systems and fighter jets and things like that, my view is we should be giving it to him. Um, and I don't understand the difference between, I mean, the United States is providing targeting intelligence, it's providing the anti-tank missiles, it's providing the anti-aircraft missiles that are killing Russians right now. And yet it's a, it's a, a provocation to give them MIGs. It's, this, this system is too much. That doesn't make any sense to me. Just you're in it at this point. You're, we've established what our ground rules would be. I, I would have supported a humanitarian car, corridor and even more, but I understand that's not on the table. Okay, fine. But if we're going to be supplying the Ukrainians, helping them with targeting, and all kinds of other stuff, then we should be giving them everything that would make it so that they could win this war, um, which then kind of leads into your third question about tactical nuclear weapons. We are in a situation right now where I think that the unspoken assumption of this administration is that if the Ukrainians are too successful, then Putin will use chemical weapons or tactical nuclear weapon or lash out in some other way that would be more difficult. And to which I sort of say, obviously nobody wants uh, to see a tactical nuclear weapon used. Uh, it is part of Russian military doctrine to use it if their army is sort of losing in a land war, which they are right now. And so, but th th that should not mean that we are deterred from wanting Ukraine to win because we're just, we're, we're not solving the problem, we're just, putting the problem off, that we'll be in a situation like this again, except this time we'll be trying to defend a NATO country. And are we still going to be saying, well, he might use a tactical, I mean, yeah, he might, it would be really bad if he did. But at this point, I think we, if Zelensky and the Ukrainians are willing to accept that risk, which they are by defending their own countries, they are aware, you know, the Russian military doctrine on tactical nuclear weapons is, is not a state secret. It's, it's uh, available for anybody to see. So if they're willing to accept that risk, then I don't understand why we are gonna be more cautious than Ukrainians at this point. And that's just because there's a risk of it doesn't mean it's going to happen. But more importantly, there's all kinds of internal pressures that we can't possibly see right now in Russia that will be further exacerbated if he loses the war. That'll be only good for our interests. 
So there's a strategic opportunity now that is worth taking. And I also think that when we are considering the possibility of a tactical nuclear weapon, as bad as that is, well, have we thought about the possibility of a frozen conflict? Have we thought about the possibility of a permanent Russian presence in Ukraine and having something like this kind of popping up every six months or something like that? Have we thought about the prospect of, you know, the Ukrainians being forced into some sort of humiliation where they have to concede territory and, you know, agree to all these kinds of Russian conditions? Is that not its own incentive for other aggressive states, large and small, to launch their own aggressive wars against their weaker neighbors if Russia can get away with it with an agreement that sort of consolidates uh, their victories. So there is a, there's a, we have to think about deterrence as well uh, in what the peace would look like, which then leads to the, your other question about, you know, what would be an acceptable outcome? I don't understand this neutrality stuff. I mean, you, it's, it's a word, but what is, is, is Ukraine supposed to be neutral against a country that has invaded it twice in the last eight years? It's supposed to be neutral? It's supposed to say, we don't, we don't take a position on our own survival? That's insane. Of course, they're not neutral. They're against the Russians. The Russians have attacked them twice, and they should be able to have a better military than the Russians so they can deter them, which is, by the way, if the argument is that the only reason, I mean, you hear this from the realists like John Mearsheimer, the only reason that we're in this pickle is because in 2008, we considered the membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia. Um, I'm sorry, that was, first of all, that was, what, uh, 14 years ago. And it's been off the table now for like a decade. But more to the point, well, isn't, and he hasn't attacked Estonia. He hasn't attacked Poland. So maybe we should have let Ukraine into NATO and that would have deterred him. So uh, I take the other view. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think that Ukraine should agree to any kind of thing. I mean, I think their position should be get off of our land or we'll force you. And if there wants to be some sort of niceties at the end of it, where largely the Russian military is defeated, and it's important at that point to sort of avoid, um, you know, avoid a scenario where Russia is totally humiliated. Um, you know, there, there's an argument for, for magnanimous, mag, being magnanimous in victory. I would agree with that, but let's get to the victory part. And I think we're putting the cart before the horse by talking about the terms that Ukraine should eventually accept as if we can tell the future. We started this war, it's an extraordinary thing. It's a bit of an aside, but I think it's relevant to it. We started this war from the US intelligence community perspective with a paradox of sorts. We managed to know Russia's military plans for Ukraine, at least if you look at the public statements before maybe even Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister kept insisting that this was like a minor, I mean, he might've been lying. But we, we certainly knew it before the soldiers who were amassed on Ukraine's border, which is an intelligence victory. It shows that the CIA has, you know, kind of knows what it's doing when it comes to predicting the Russian military. We've been training the Ukrainian military for eight years. We had no idea that they were as resilient and strong as they were because we offered Zelensky a helicopter ride out, you know, in the first day of the conflict. And he said, I don't need a helicopter, I need more ammo. That's it. It's interesting to me. It's like a, it's sort of an intelligence victory when it came to predicting Russia and an utter failure to understand the military we'd been training for eight years. So I, I, I think we should be humbled by that instead of trying to figure out what, a, what would be acceptable terms to stop the war, you know, that Zelensky could accept that would be okay for Russia. Let's win the war first. That's, that's generally my view. Let's win the war and let's assume. And then we can talk about the terms, but let's, 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 let's talk about the terms after the Russian army is broken. And let's assume that our ally, Ukraine at the moment, can do what it says it can do, which I think yeah. has some lessons in it for um, US Israel. And I don't want to go through them because, you know, we're, we're, I want to try to stick to Ukraine and Europe, but it does seem to me that the United States may have some of the same issues regarding what Israel will do and perhaps Israel regarding Iran or you know those sorts of things. So maybe what you're what you're saying, what you're arguing here, is the United States needs to reevaluate both its allies and its adversaries and make sure that we understand them in a way that will serve our long-term interests. Um, we missed a bunch of stuff on the Russians. I think we gave the Russians enormous credit for military right. capabilities that they didn't have. Um, right. I would have been afraid of that Russian tank column. Well, it turns out that Russian tank column isn't worth having. So, so maybe I think 
They're arguing here for an American reassessment, not to put goals on Ukraine, but to reassess where we stand. Right. right. And that's going to lead me to the last question that we have time for. And I'm going to shift gears just a little bit um, and talk about China. And you've talked about uh, rare earth minerals, and we've been doing that for a long time in, in Focus Magazine, everybody in Focus Magazine. We've had some good articles on rare earth minerals. Um, there was a remarkable turnaround in US public opinion as regards Russia with this invasion. I mean, you could just see Americans felt like that, and now they really don't like Russia. China, however, seems to get a pass all the way down the pike, partly because our government wants that to be the case while we're looking at rare earth minerals. Also because we like cheap stuff from China. Also because we're not sure what's gonna happen if we turn them off. What should the United States be doing to reassess its relationship with China? And I'm gonna throw one more thing in because it's our last question. People who listen know that I like to end on a positive note. And so if you can find some way to answer the China question with a little positive spin at the end, I would be most appreciative. Where are we well, going? I'll start with a positive spin on China. We've seen both parties. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, uh, when I think of his successes, is he began to reorient America's relationship with China. He began to understand, I should say, there were elements of what Trump was doing that he didn't quite understand the full term implications of, but certainly Matt Pottinger, his deputy national security advisor, and other people who were in the Trump administration began laying out a really serious strategy for separation and strategic competition and deterrence with China uh, that we hadn't seen under both parties for some time. So, so that's the first thing I would say that that starts under Trump. Did the Biden administration throw it all away? No, they didn't. They kept a lot of it going. So there has been a little bit of a kind of, at least in Washington, a sort of slouching towards a new reassessment with China. And that's a generally good thing. And both parties are beginning to get behind it. And I don't think that the voices for, you know, treating China the way we always, I don't, I think that they've been largely diminished. Where we see, um, I think a problematic view of that is where is kind of in corporate, corporate elites. The NBA, you know, a few years ago, punishing Daryl Morey uh, now the general manager of my beloved 76ers, uh, for tweeting solidarity with Hong Kong. Um, that was embarrassment. It's embarrassing for the stars of the NBA who backed up that message. It was, uh, it, it showed exactly what the, the kind of, the, that, that, what, that trade with China, that, that working with China will put you in, will, will morally compromise you. And, but I was hardened by the pushback. So, you know, Big NBA kind of like, you know, tries to disappear Daryl Morey's Twitter feed and then he gets another job and lots of people criticize the, the NBA for that. And I think that there's now beginning, at least culturally speaking, it's harder to track, but we're starting to sort of see an amassing of forces on the other side of the issue. It's not all just sort of, you know, China, we can learn so much from China. It's not, not that big a deal if we take this flag off the new Top Gun movie or whatever. That's Hollywood right now. That's that's sort of the, the corporate world. But there's there's a popular, I think, response to China because of China's own doing. I mean, like the 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 information is there about the treatment of the Uyghurs and the cultural genocide against them. The information is there about what they were able to do to Hong Kong, and you know, it, it's it's getting out. So I'm I'm somewhat optimistic. I think that we're beginning to sort of see a pushback there. But it's going to take. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to take a lot of, a lot of uh, fight uh, with you know, hedge funds like BlackRock and things like you know. There, there, there are a lot of people who want to kind of continue with the old assumptions that uh, we have to do business with China. It's good for both countries, and you know, over time this will moderate them, which it hasn't done. Um, and then I look at our allies, and I'm very optimistic. I mean, look at the revolution in Australia in a few years where they have taken a completely different view. There really isn't a political constituency for being dovish on China at this point. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities at this point. And I think the Chinese could have been encouraged on Taiwan because of Ukraine. And now I would say that they're, 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 they're looking at this and they're saying, well, there's potentially a world of hurt that could come our way. 
economically and, and in terms of isolation, that may make them, I mean, we can't know, but that might give them pause. And that's, that's, that's a good thing too. So we're going to stop here because I consider that a really optimistic ending. There you go. A, we are a, an ocean liner perhaps, and we turn slowly, but we do yep. turn, our allies do too. And any rethinking that China does about a quick grab of Taiwan, uh, perhaps they've been discouraged from that. So I consider that a good note. And Eli, I want to thank you for thank you. a really great, big, broad um, discussion, because I, I worry sometimes that we get very narrow in the United States. Should we give them MIGs? Should we give them you know, this or that? But no, we need to assess who we are and what we are. I just, I love that and I appreciate it. So to our listeners, um, find Eli's podcasts, right? That are coming next yes. week. And also read it in commentary. It's, it's oh, this read, And read commentary, read the commentary article. Um, Thursday this week, we are coming back and we're gonna do, see, we gotta do, we're gonna, it's a balancing act. Mostly Ukraine today, but we are going to have Ellie Kohanim on Thursday. And she is gonna talk about Iran and the Iran deal and the mess that is inside of Iran. And she will be terrific as Eli was terrific. This is really great. Thank you very much. And I hope we can have you back one day. I, I hope to come back and it was a real honor to be here. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you.